Aloha, and welcome to What's Bugging You, brought to you by Hawaii's leader in pest control and the first company in Hawaii to earn the National Quality Pro Certification, Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Now, here's the host of our show, Mike Buck. Well, hello there, and welcome aboard. And, you know, usually I get together with Michael Bolfe, and we uh, we pre-record the show for airing here. And all week long, I've been having a horrible time getting a hold of Michael because he's been so busy, because so many things have been bugging so many people. And the big thing in the news today, in the last couple of days, has been something that could be a big problem for Hawaii, any invasive species, but particularly this thing called the Brazilian wandering spider. And boy, oh boy, can this thing be a nightmare. How you doing, Michael? Good, Mike. Thanks for having me on the show. You know, every time you're here, we talk about something else really new and fascinating. And I mean, you know, we're going to talk about the the age-old wonder of cockroaches in in this program. We're going to talk about uh, centipedes, which everybody's scared to death. But this thing, this is really spooky. What do you know about this animal? Yep. So uh, the Brazilian wandering spider is actually a hunting spider. It doesn't live in a in a web like a conventional spider might do. Mm-hmm. This is a large spider. It can get up to five inches diameter, and uh, with its with its legs. And uh, they actually are on the ground, and they seek out prey to attack and, and kill. So they actually... It's um, like a drone, a spider drone. You know? Well, they actually eat uh, small rodents. Wow. Uh, so it's known as one of the most aggressive spiders in the world, as well as one of the most venomous. Okay. Have we ever had one here before that you know of? I've never heard of them being intercepted. What, why would they be here? Why, what would bring them here? Well, they're very common in South America, okay. and I believe in certain areas in Central America. Yep. And so sometimes when people import goods from these countries, um, they basically stow away in the packaging or in the goods themselves, <clears throat> and that's how they show up in, in the container when it arrives in Hawaii. Okay, and speaking about that, we have on the phone a dear friend who is also uh, a sponsor in one of our other programs, our Fix It Friday program here on KHNR, as Michael both is from Sandwich Island. He is uh, the number one guy in Hawaii for providing a wide variety of, uh, of, of flooring, of tile, of, of unbelievable products. In, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, one of these uh, uh, these Brazilian wandering spiders hitchhike. So not only is he an expert now in all kinds of flooring, but he's having to become a bug expert. That's right. And joins us today, Kevin Nip from Selective Stone on our, our newsmaker line. Kevin, hello. Oh, well, how appropriate. You know, how are you guys doing there? How's it going, Very Kevin? well. You know, this is, I guess, something that you've been aware of because you, you literally import things from all over the globe. What sort of precautions are taken and whose responsibility are these creepy things? Well, that's uh, kind of, uh, what should I say, it's in limbo at this particular moment. Um, we've been trying to work this thing out uh, with the state, obviously, uh, State Department of Agriculture. Uh, we've also been trying to uh, work this with the uh, uh, the exporter in Brazil. Uh, but it's been, uh, like I said, it's been, it's been a challenge because on the other end, uh, they're trying to work this out, uh, the Brazilian company, feels that, and likewise we do, that uh, this particular containers of ours, and there are two, should be able to go through fumigation uh, in order to eradicate and kill any other spiders that could possibly be in there or eggs or sacs. Yeah, and that's best case scenario. And obviously they got a, they called uh, Michael, and so Michael, you told me that, that they called you up and said, hey, listen, can you help us out with this? Where does it sit right now? Yeah, so we're one of the, uh, I think we might be the only fumigation company that does quarantine work. Um, So we're very involved with um, inbound pests that are under quarantine and often help out with it. In this particular case, uh, um, Kevin, what what happened was um, they asked us what we could do to eradicate the pest. Um, We recommended fumigation, and at the point that they were reviewing the service protocols to do that, they realized that the Brazilian wandering spider does not exist on any fumigation label. That means that there hasn't been scientific research conducted on that specific species of spider with the fumigant. So they haven't determined the actual dosage necessary to kill all life cycles and stages of that particular species. And so the um, Department of Agriculture is very concerned that perhaps the standard fumigation procedures might not work. And in that case, then the, the Brazilian spider might survive the treatment. Yeah, that's really interesting. But here, from a businessman standpoint, Kevin, this must be kind of frustrating because you want to sell the stuff that's in the container. But obviously, well, you know. Yeah, but obviously, I, but obviously, yeah. I know that you care about the environment to the point where you're not even thinking about that right now. But but you certainly don't want to send the stuff back, do you? 
Well, no. I mean, obviously, you, you, you hit it on the nose, Mike. I am concerned about the ecosystem here in the state of the people of the state of Hawaii, more so because, you know, I grew up here. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I certainly believe, in that, and I know Mike from Sam would attest to that, that we can we can basically kill anything in that container. And, yeah. and, and it's, yes, and it, it hasn't been labeled. And, and, and the Brazilians actually, Mike, uh, with Sam Chow, have offered to give their assistance. So they may have the chemicals or, or something of the light that we could possibly acquire or we may have here locally. Yeah, you know, um, Kevin, I, I have some suggestions myself on how to deal with this. And uh, I think that this incident um, has illustrated that there is a need to develop a protocol for treating um, inbound pests that do not exist on a label. And so I think that there's a method of, of doing that. Um, and I, we can go into a great deal of discussion about it, but essentially we could use the fumigants that exist that are labeled today um, at the highest rate possible for the longest right. exposure possible um, and then wait until the eggs hatch um, of the insect and then do another fumigation to address all of the newly emerged juveniles or adults that have not yet mated and, and had new eggs, kill all of them, follow that up with an inspection, and identify whether or not the treatment was successful. If it was successful, that's it. End of story. And I think you could adopt that to any species of insect. Uh, Kevin, is this out of the ordinary? I mean, we have some other stuff that we're going to do, but obviously you're in the import business, and, and I know how much attention you pay. And that must mean that your folks, when you undo containers or shipments, uh, always got your eye open just in case. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, you know, it, there, there's been a, uh, a major issue in, in the past with uh, a beetle uh, that uh, comes from, from Asia, uh, Southeast Asia in particular, and it's the a Southeast Asian longhorn beetle. And, and, and this, this has been a, a, a problem probably ongoing now for maybe six, seven, maybe seven years. And, and, and we're always paying attention to this, especially with that, because this particular be- beetle eats wood. So it's mainly in the crating of most people's stone products. Mm-hmm. So that's been our, our focus for, for the last, I'd say, seven to seven years, Bob. Well, I can tell you one thing. I know that you guys, I'm glad that it happened to a shipment of yours because you're way more, more stand up and heads up about this. So obviously. I'm glad it happened to me. You guys going to pay my bill? Yeah, ex- absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I just thought Michael, well, Michael put his thumbs up. In South Africa, that means, yeah, we got you covered. <laughs> well, Kevin, what well, we'll do is, um, what, what I'm going to do is, I, I mentioned to you, I'd already met with, the, with three different senators, <clears throat> and I know you met with the governor yesterday. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do whatever is possible to see how we can help you with this particular problem and then see what we can do moving forward so that when we identify these invasive species that don't exist on the label, that we have some treatment methodology that's approved so that you don't have to ship it back. Can I, can I say one thing because you used the word invasive? I mean, are, are we sure, and I, I did happen to read a little bit about uh, this particular spider myself, and it was not identified, and there's no proof of it being invasive, because that just depends on the ecosystem of one's country and whether they want to be invasive. They want to multiply and live in this type of environment. Environmentally, I know it's very similar to climates are. Well, invasive basically means that it was, it was introduced by man, and okay. uh, it, it, it can harm either the environment or, 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 or human health right. or animal but health. But it doesn't mean it will multiply. No, it doesn't. I, I, right. It doesn't mean that at all. It just okay. means that okay. uh, they, it's it's not a desired species that can okay. cause harm. Thanks yeah, but you question. know, but, but what we're going to do is gas them just to make sure, right? <laughs> oh no, understandably yeah. now. Yeah, I yeah. mean, wouldn't gassing a container because it's an animal or it's an insect or pest that breeds? Wouldn't gassing a container if there were any sacs or eggs? Wouldn't that kill that as well before it even hatches? Well, that's a that's a great question, Kevin. And how fumigants work? And and basically, I would recommend two modes of action. I would use something um, that's uh, DDVP Vapona, which is actually a uh, almost like a fogging at the same time. You could do both at the same right. time, which is different modes of action. Um, and that actually has spiders on the label. <clears throat> but um, mm-hmm. the issue with fumigants is that different insect eggs have a different degree of permeability, which means that um, unless research is done on every single egg, you don't know exactly what the dosage is needed to uh, penetrate that egg capsule. Right, right. And so the 
you know, th that's the question. But there's things you can do to make an insect hatch sooner, and you can adjust the temperature. Um, right. you, there are known um, hatch rates, and so it's a matter of identifying that for each insect and then, and then having a protocol that will work for that particular insect. Okay, in, in, in any case, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it very much because Anytime. we thank know you, how busy you are. And, and I'm, I'm so glad that you guys are dealing on this thing because I'm not going to worry about having this thing in the middle of the night give me a bite where I don't want it. No, they're going to be dead. Yeah, the next time Mike Buck can call me, I hope it's about stone. Okay? <laughs> okay. All right, my friend. Hello. <laughs> there you go. That's Kevin, you, Kevin. Kevin, Kevin Nip from Selective Stone here in Honolulu, the number one guys uh, with uh, with stoneware, period, in Hawaii. And, and, I mean, what they've got, my whole yard's full of their stuff. It's just terrific stuff. Okay, uh, what we're here today, though, that's just the first thing that got Michael going this week. Uh, but all of a sudden, and I'm not sure why, uh, we, we have these little pesky fire ants we're going to talk about, right? And, and, and as usual, you can't do a pest control program without talking about the two big C's, the centipedes and the cockroaches. Yeah, I think, you know, Mike, um, what we try to do is before the show, we'll, we'll look at our lead flow and try to mm -hmm. identify what are the most common cause. What's happening this and week or whatever, right? I'll tell yeah. you what's happening this week. It's cockroaches mm -hmm. and centipedes. And then ants in general, more like just general house ants are the problem. But, mm -hmm. but with the slightly warmer weather we've been having lately, <clears throat> the uh, cockroaches are just swarming everywhere. And so um, we have 19 different species of cockroaches in Hawaii. Is that so, right? So that's our I, I know we had several, like 19 yeah, of them. 19. Right? Yeah, yeah. But there's, there's three that are primarily... Uh, Evasive. I mean, everybody has these three mm -hmm. or has encountered them. And that is the large one that you call the B2 bomber, yeah, yeah. the American cockroach. That's the, that's the good old Yankee cockroach, right? That, yeah, that, that's yeah, right. Then the yeah. smaller ones that breed um, at such an incredible rate, those are the German cockroaches, which mm -hmm. are found in restaurants mostly. A lot smaller. In commercial kitchens, that type of thing. Yeah. Much smaller. Mm -hmm. Often come in packaged cardboard, which is why they often end up in restaurants. Okay. Because they've got so much um, goods coming yeah, in. Yeah, produce particularly, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the, the third one is the Pacific beetle roach, which if you go outside anywhere and dig around in the soil, you'll see that little shiny black wobbly sure. yeah, thing yeah. kind of wobbling around. They can't walk real good. You know what's funny to me? I mean, when you're a little kid, bugs are bugs, you know, and, and, and then you start learning to differentiate between, say, beetles and things. But it seems to me that what you're talking about, uh, cockroaches have a lot of different appearances. They're, they, they're, they're very dissimilar to each other. But what, why are they all classed in that category? They're in the, the order uh, Blatteria, which is the given name for all right, of the for different cockroaches. cockroaches. Yeah. <clears throat> and they range in size from and, and color from the mm -hmm. death's head cockroach, which is massive. Mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, you know, it's probably three inches long. Oh, brother. And, oh. Uh, and then, Talk about know, a nightmare. And then there's beautiful yeah. ones. The yeah. Cuban cockroach is a bright green cockroach. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and so there's all different types of cockroaches, but, and they exist everywhere. Do they have a good purpose? Because we know that they scare the heck out of you in the middle of the night when you turn the light on, okay? And we know that if you get one in your ear or something in your mouth when you're riding a bicycle, you freak out. But are, do they have a role? Are they good for something? You know, I'm sure they're good for something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is, but, uh, this is, the, the answer is probably no. Yeah. It's just a bug. I, I don't know. The, yeah. in, in terms of measured from a human standpoint, yeah. I'm sure they're good in the environment because they're a food source for other insects and other creatures. Yep. But uh, like centipedes, for example, live on them. But um, in, in terms of having them in your house, yeah. there's no good reason because – Cockroaches have been found to be one of the leading causes of allergies mm -hmm. and asthma in children. Yeah, and we do know that they emit a, a allergen. A, yeah, which, which if you are susceptible to uh, uh, to a bronchial disease of any kind, it's going to get you. But particularly if you're a young kid and and have asthma or type, you know, the the regular asthma rather than um, type two. That yeah. that's exactly right, and 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 so. The, the one thing is the health concern. So mm -hmm. firstly, they, they're disgusting. <clears throat> they, yeah. they carry all kinds of diseases. Now, especially the American cockroach, which is the giant one, right? Mm -hmm. Those actually prefer to live in the sewers. Oh, How disgusting is that? So That's pretty they, disgusting. They live in the sewers, and then at night they come out, and they mm -hmm. fly into your house, and they crawl over the kitchen table and countertops where you prepare food. Yeah, I, but, I can tell you, you know, one thing. I know people that will never go into certain restaurants ever again. If they see one, boom, they're out of there, and they never go back because they just associate cockroaches with disease. Here's the, my rule of thumb. Mm. If I walk into a restaurant and I see an American cockroach, yep. I feel their pain, and I understand there's not much they can yeah, do about yeah, it yeah. because those things are really strong flies, and what probably happened is it flew through an open door, mm -hmm. especially a lot of the restaurants in Hawaii are open, open, open air restaurants. You yeah. can't blame a restaurant yeah. for having cockroaches fly in. I also learned the lesson a long time ago from a friend of mine who had a restaurant in Waikiki, 
And most of the restaurant was built with beautiful moss rock walls. Oh, they love that. They love them. Yeah, they, they live they, in they're all like colonies walls. in them. Oh, the yeah. cracks, right? It's, uh, um, it's perfect. But the German cockroach is now on, on another story. So mm-hmm. when, you, when you're when sitting at a restaurant table, and which has happened to me, mm-hmm. I actually was having pancakes. And... Uh, a German cockroach came out and started eating the syrup on the oh, side of our <laughs> on the side of our plate. That's just a no, bit that, much. Yeah, no, that's yeah, disgusting. Yeah, yeah. So when you have German cockroaches, which basically um, have a real high reproductive rate, and they're nesting on a table, yeah. that's because there's no other spaces left in the kitchen for them to hide. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, I know that there's a lot of people that feel that they they're they're shortchanging their family that they're that they're doing something disgusting. And I do know that, uh, for instance, for for us for a long time, uh, I almost could at any given point. You know, a couple of years back, turn on the kitchen light in the night, and there'd be a cockroach on the floor on the counter somewhere. And for some reason, and I don't know if it's maybe we put things away better or clean the counters better or whatever it is. I know we still have them, but we don't see them. Just because you have salmon jaw. That's probably it. You know, and <laughs> no. and and and, uh, and and I do know that that you have to be happy with control rather than eradication because you're not likely to totally eradicate. Them. That's a great point, and yeah. you know the, the the key thing to remember there. It's kind of like flies and mm-hmm. mosquitoes. Yeah. You can do a really good treatment, but the thing is you're not hitting them out of the air as they're flying over that treatment. Yep. And so there's always going to be those that fly, that breach that wall of treatment and, and get in. So, um, you know, cockroaches, the, the things I would tell people is <clears throat> the little Pacific beetle roaches which live outside, mm-hmm. those are not a problem. You don't yep. have to worry about killing them. But what you do have to do is you have to kill them around the perimeter of your house. Yep. Because if you don't kill them around the per- perimeter of your house, the things that eat them are going to come into your house looking for them to get them now listen there's been a lot of um you know old wives tales and things about what you can do are there some things that you can apply near your entryways or on your windowsills or something that will act as a barricade you know there's all kinds of over-the-counter products Mm -hmm. Uh, boric acid um is something that we use you use that a lot a lot in fact the boric acid dust which you can buy at walmart Mm -hmm. um they're not the same quality or or um particle size that we use, which yeah. is really what separates a professional product from a, an sure. over-the-counter product. But uh, the bottom line is the active ingredient is very similar. <clears throat> and boric acid lasts forever. It's an inorganic compound. It's fairly harmless to mm-hmm. humans uh, and animals. And uh, it absolutely works. So there's boric acid baits for roaches. There's mm-hmm. dusts. There's powders. And so if someone wanted to do their, their own service, <clears throat> my recommendation would be seek out boric acid dust. It's your single best thing. Dust your mm-hmm. attic, dust the the voids inside your cabinets, mm-hmm. plumbing voids, and uh, that works really, really well. We'll put it in any cracks and crevices around the outside. Um, but the key thing is to make sure they're not inside. So how do they get inside? They mostly mm-hmm. get inside by flying. So that means you have to exclude them. So screen doors. Yep. Make sure your screen doors are in good condition. Screen By the way, the, the whole open. beautiful door, if it has one little hole down the corner, Doesn't might work. as well not even have the door, right? That's it. Vroom, they come in like heat-seeking missiles. My, my, yeah. my worst one is, is windows. You go to a person who has absolutely beautiful windows and screens, but the screens are pulled so that there's a gap underneath one of the sides, <laughs> or the, and that's where they're coming come from. Come on in. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So make sure that the screens are, are not only in good condition, but they have a tight seal. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then um, limit the... Limit bringing cardboard into your house. Mm -hmm. So here's what happens. Someone decides that they're going to move. They go to behind Foodland or wherever. They're going to grab some cardboard boxes or Costco. So they get a whole bunch of cardboard boxes. Now those boxes, if you follow the line back, those boxes were formed in a factory. They were taken to a distribution warehouse. Mm -hmm. They were sent to a food handling place Mm -hmm. that that filled them up with whatever it was and uh, left in a warehouse somewhere, then shipped from one place to another. Finally, they arrive in Hawaii and the, the... product is taken out of that box, put on the shelf, they throw the box in the back. Mm-hmm. So now that box has been subject to all kinds of, of pest <laughs> exposure. And uh, very often they have cockroach eggs in those corrugated portions in the cardboard. Sure. And, and by the way, that's just like, a, isn't that like a honeycomb, like like a beehive? That's it. They yeah, love yeah, it. They, yeah. they, they, they eat some of the material. Mm-hmm. They nest. It's a perfect place for them to nest. And so then you get to Costco or wherever it might be. You load up, put your things in the box, take them inside the house. Unpack it and leave the box inside to be thrown out the next right. day. Or reused. Or reused. Or, or, or packing some stuff in to put in the garage. And everything yeah. that's inside that box is yeah. like now in your home. Hey, you know, that's another thing. Uh, and I know that when you get in, a lot of times you do homes, and particularly when there's been a sale, and they're going to get fumigated, and they're going to get treated and everything else. When you find things that people leave behind, and you go into garages and storage containers and find out that there's a cardboard box that literally is walking around in the building. Um 
and I'm guessing because there's a food source in there, but I'm I'm hard pressed to find out what it is if it hasn't been organic and live and viable. Why is something in a box good for something else to eat years later? Yeah, you know, Mike, like a photograph. I, I have no idea. If, uh, for example, mm. carpenter ants, mm-hmm. for some reason, love old photograph albums. Yeah. So we found more carpenter ants in photograph albums. So people have old photographs and albums yeah. and keep them in the attic. And that's where the nest is. There's something to do with the film um, of the old style photographs, yeah. not the, all these the, digital things. The amalgam, the silver, whatever it yeah, is. I'm not you know? sure, yeah. But, but you know, isn't it sort of a shame? Because I knew, you know that there's a lot of family uh, heirlooms and, and, and things that you thought were, were packed away in the, in the attic and they were safe. You're telling me that the, a, an attic is like a zoo for, for critters. Yeah. <laughs> well, cockroaches love yeah. to live in the attic. So yeah. there's, there's another one called the Australian cockroach mm-hmm. which, or harlequin cockroach. It absolutely loves uh, to live in the attics. So it's nice. It likes the heat and the and the dryness. Mm-hmm. And what those do is anything you put up there. So if you put up a box of clothes or a bag of clothes, they'll get in there and they'll eat that. Um, so let's say there was some sort of food stain on a on a jacket, and you they'll eat the jacket. They'll, they'll is go that right? They'll find that they go food eat that stain. thing. Yeah, you might not see it, but yeah. there'll be an odor there, and they'll get some nutritional value from eating yeah. that. And so that, that's how they you get little holes in your clothes. What little scroungers? Yeah. Okay, uh, we got a lot of other stuff to cover, but but you know we always react to what's happening, and maybe you could re-explain. For those people that are just joining this year on what's bugging you, uh, brought to you by Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions, the best, is why did it come up this week? Is it, is it weather related? Uh, why all of a sudden everybody talking about cockroaches? I don't know the answer for it, except that they must be more abundant, which mm-hmm. is why we're getting more cores. So we base the, the selection of what topic to talk about based on the number of cores on that particular subject. And in the last week or so, there's been a huge increase in the number of people calling and saying, man, we've got cockroaches everywhere. Jeez. What can we do about it? But let me, let me just leave another message about the, the uh, cockroaches, those specific beetle roaches. That kind of leads into the next thing we'll talk about, which is centipedes. No. They yeah. live in the mulch areas, and they're actually a good thing. They help break down the mulch. Mm-hmm. But what happens is the centipedes follow them and eat them. That's the centipede's favorite prey. And so when people have... So you have a good guy... Followed by a bad guy. That's it. So yeah. when you have a mulch pile next to your house, yeah. or let's say you have that nice wood sort of chip um, covering oh, yeah, yeah. on, the, on the side yeah. of your on house. On the mainland, that's a great thing, right? Yeah. Here's not so good. No, because you a, have it's, termites it's, and roaches it's and like, it's, it, Yeah, it's like a smorgasbord. Yeah, exactly. And ants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so, so what happens is um, when those things are around your perimeter, that's what draws in the centipede. So my recommendation is always rake back any mulch or any leaf litter around the, the yeah. foundation of your structure because that's where the Pacific beetle roaches will go and the centipedes will follow. All right. that's uh, Speaking about centipedes, that's what's coming up here on What's Bugging You. And if you want to hear something uh, on the program, you can get to sandwichisle.com. That's sandwichisle.com and click a button and communicate and let us know. And we'll be back in one second to talk about the next creepy crawly thing on What's Bugging You. And those, of course, are these horrific things called centipedes. Aloha, and welcome to What's Bugging You. Oh, yes. That's what you're watching, and we're glad you're with us, and we want you to stay right where you are. And I'll tell you why it's important. Uh, when, when it comes time to choose, why should you choose Sandwich Isle? Listen to this. Why choose Sandwich Isle's pest prevention over pest control? The last thing I want to worry about are bugs and centipedes around my wife and kids. At Sandwich Isle, we believe in pest prevention, not pest control. The bottom line is we want to prevent these pests from getting into your house in the first place. We look at things like caulking and sealing gaps, holes and cracks around your house. We do a lot of things that are different, that don't involve any pesticides whatsoever. I love Sandwich Isle. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it. As the largest fumigation company in Hawaii, we know that sometimes tent in your home just isn't the best solution. We really wanted to avoid the hassle of moving out. Tent fumigation just didn't work for our family. Sandwich Isle offers an eco-friendly alternative to fumigation. They use a special engineered orange oil that provides natural termite control. No tenting, no moving, no hassle, and no risk. Our orange oil service is the most convenient and environmentally responsible treatment available. Call us to learn more about orange oil today. Up, two, three, four. Yep. I'm Mike Buck, and welcome back to part two of What's Bugging You? Brought to you uh, by Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions, the complete leader in pest control in Hawaii. And, you know, what you're learning here is some of it's not rocket science, but it's 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 because of decades of following this. As you learned in previous programs, the reason why the owner of the company sounds a little bit different is because he is. He comes from South Africa. 
But the interesting thing about South Africa, he grew up because his grandfather was in the pest control business. Hawaii is just like South Africa. We got the same bugs. We got the same conditions. And so that means all of that, you didn't waste time. And you, you, there was no misspent youth. What happened is you were guided by divine providence to come to Hawaii and help us. That's right. And I hate, <laughs> and I, and I hate snakes. So I'm glad there's no snakes here. That's right. That's that's what right. We have to do yeah. And by the way, um, are there snakes there? There are. We had. Uh, that was one of the things we used to do as in, as part of my. I remember company, somebody, Yeah. Was uh, catching snakes, and uh, as a as a kid, I'd go out with my dad, and and he would be catching black mambas and green mambas and wow. puff adders and night are, adders. Are, and, are you surprised that we don't have snakes here? Because it would seem like, and there have been a lot of tries. You know, the the green tree snake and some others, some some pythons and stuff that get here. Uh, if they did take a hold here, we'd have an issue. Honestly, Mike, um, I find it hard to believe that snakes do not exist in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if you go down to the quarantine station, you'll see how many snakes they've captured. They capture them, right? Or yeah. that people have turned in that weren't captured. They start feeling guilty or something. <laughs> so at some point, they turn them in. And uh, there were some hunters that found a path on about five, six years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I spend a lot of time hiking in the wilderness areas on, on Oahu especially. And uh, we've got some fantastic wilderness areas that are so remote. Some of these deep canyons and, mm-hmm. and, and gorges, it's very hard to get to. And Boy, that would be perfect for them, wouldn't it? <clears> there's yeah. so, many, so much bird life, mongoose. Mm. Uh, there's feral pigs for the bigger, bigger mm. snakes. Uh, I cannot believe that snakes don't exist here. I believe they do, but they're probably not in breeding um, pairs. Well, what are those things? I know you get asked this every now and again when you're taking up stones or things in your yard. You'll open it up, and this thing will be all wiggling all around and jumping all over the place, looking like a snake. It's a worm of some kind. Yeah, that little, uh, that little Hawaiian yeah, yeah, snake they call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's a little black thing. Yeah, it's a few yeah. inches long. Spooky, though. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, they, they, they're very delicate and yeah. obviously no harm. Okay, um, let's talk about when we say spooky. I'll tell you a really quick story since we're talking about centipedes today. When I, when I was a little kid one, one Christmas, my grandfather, you know, grandpas always have the robe, right, and the pipe. <laughs> and he reaches in his pocket to get his pipe on Christmas morning. We're all sitting around the Christmas tree. This is in Kahala when I was a little kid. And he pulls out his hand, and right between his second uh. and third finger, there's this long centipede hanging that bit him. Uh. And his hand turned into about like a basketball, yeah. and, he, and he went into anaphylactic shock because he, no, he didn't know, but he was allergic to him. Uh, all I needed, I was about five when I saw that. To this day, I'm a big old dude, man. Centipedes, I'm, I'm going the other direction. What's the problem with centipedes, and, and how once you de- once you determine that you've got a problem, how do you deal with them? All right, well, let's talk about the centipedes. So there's actually three different centipedes there of in, course. in Hawaii. You know, <laughs> of course, you know this. I mean, yeah. yikes! But yeah. there's only one species that's that's uh, kind of harmful yeah. to humans and of any concern, and that is that large tropical centipede. Right, and they get huge. I mean, seventeen. Centimeters is the scientific data run. So what is that? About eight about inches. About eight inches. That's so, big. Man. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. I, they I've get a, seen they can get as round, big around as your baby finger. They that's get pretty it. big. And yeah. so they're big. Mm-hmm. They're extremely aggressive. If you mess with the centipede, it'll yeah, yeah. mess with you. Yeah, you that's know, a good point. When, when you when you, if you're digging in the yard and you lift up a rock that is under, it's not going to it's not going to just run away. If you touch it, it'll it'll turn around. And it'll bite you. Do, do you know that I'm the head uh, potting soil guy in my family? Because once years ago, my wife put a little cup into a potting soil thing to get some potting soil out of there, centipede, that's it. Yeah. She thinks every bag of potting soil got her centipede in it. Well, uh, what, you know, if you get bit by them, yeah. you, that, that's why, because people learn from their, their mistakes with yeah. them. And, and I've been bit five times by a centipede. Wow. And i, I got to tell you, I think it's the most painful. I, I think it's probably four or five times, the, for me, yeah. as painful as a bee sting. And wow. so what, here's what you got for centipedes. Did, but by the way, do all the workers from Sandwich Isles get a little extra star on their chart if they get bitten or stung by something? <laughs> <laughs> to be know, honest, hey, we actually, hazard pay. we've actually had <laughs> yeah. people quit. Combat because, pay. We've had people quit because of centipedes. Yeah. I, I had a, a great yeah. big guy, he's about mm-hmm. six foot five, and his job was to go into the crawl space of houses. Oh, my. And, uh, and, and treat. And he, he was ill suited to that job to begin with, just he because he couldn't of his get bulk, out. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he couldn't oh. get out quickly, oh. and he was in a, centip- in a centipede infested crawl space. And he actually he broke down. He's like, Look, yeah. I cannot. Listen, ever do Michael, this again. we're making light of it, but in actual fact, I do know that if you've got an infant or if you've got a problem, or like you said, it's extremely painful, and a lot of people register pain in different ways, this can be a real issue. Yeah, and yeah. Can, people can go into shock. So here's yeah. the thing. The centipedes are big, mm-hmm. and so they have two modified appendages on their front end, which is basically their venomous um, the, Those are the, teeth, the, the, the right? pokey-looking things, right? So what they typically do is, in, 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 in nature, what they'll do is they have these appendages on their, their back modified legs mm-hmm. that they use to capture, say, a cockroach. A grab. Yeah. So they'll grab it, mm-hmm. roll their body around it to hold it in place, and then they'll spin around 
and sink their fangs into that insect or whatever it is that they're eating. <sighs> Yuck. Inject poison into it oh. and then hold on to it until it dies from the poison. The poison is pretty effective, so it kills it in a few seconds usually. So that's what they do in the wild. Now, when they come into your house, let's say they're chasing after some of those Pacific beetle roaches, they actually don't know the difference between a house and a rock mm-hmm. or a tree. Right? They just yeah. know that it's a place where there might be another roach. So they crawl into your bed and you roll over, feel something squirming on you, oh, and uh, next minute you get nailed. I'm glad yeah, you're listening to this show during the day because at nighttime, this would not be a happy show. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. so that's what they do. Yeah. If, if you, you, know, you brush it off, it'll instinctively turn around and react, and it'll sink its fangs into you and inject poison. Mm-hmm. So sometimes, um, I was but three times by one centipede the one time. Yeah, and, I was going to uh, ask you about that. Can, they, can one centipede bite you multiple times? Yeah, so yeah, in my yeah. case, I was sleeping, mm-hmm. and uh, it, I was in Molokai, mm-hmm. and uh, I was sleeping, and it, it, it crawled up my stomach, and I was under the sheet, and so I could feel it walking towards me, so I tried to figure out where, it's, where it was, where and it slapped so it, slap it, and held it, and it bit me three times yeah, whilst I was, I was trying to get say, it off me. All you did was irritate it. it right? It's amazing, because <laughs> yeah. they, they were actually cr- grab you with their, their, their mm-hmm. other legs and mm-hmm. hold on, so they now, you mentioned that there are three kinds, mainly in three kinds. I do know that there's a, a millipede, which is a little tiny thing about maybe an inch and a half, two inches long, or if that. that is that a centipede or not? No, so, so millipedes um, mm. are harmless, mm. <clears throat> although you can't eat them because they, they have some sort of poison inside yeah. them. Um, and I'm glad to know. No more stir-fried millipedes. Yeah, no me. more. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, millipedes are pretty interesting. In fact, in Africa, they get huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we had millipedes there that were almost 12 inches long. My goodness. And uh, almost an inch wide. And oh, uh, so um, yeah. anyway, so the millipedes. No here, wonder you came to Hawaii. Yeah. You got snakes and, and millipedes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, millipedes yeah. are not a problem. So millipedes are normally the result of uh, a, a soil uh, moisture type mm-hmm. issue around mm-hmm. the foundation. And what it is is they like to eat the fungus. Um, that develops in those areas. I get you. And okay. so if you have a lot of, uh, if you have poor drainage along the foundation, you'll attract them in there, mm-hmm. and then one day it's going to rain a lot, and they're all going to get flooded out of there, so they'll head for higher ground. And that's mm-hmm. how people suddenly, one day they've got millipedes everywhere. Yeah, by the way, you, you're right. And, and I remember talking to uh, one of your clients when I was out there one time that had a bunch of them. It looked like a rush of them. They'd probably been there all along, but some weather phenomenon made them all come out. Yeah, usually yeah. it's usually it's flooding. Mm-hmm. So okay. suddenly there's flooding and they're just everywhere. Okay, so that's not one of the three. I mean, we got three no. centipedes. Well, that's a, that's a millipede, different, mm-hmm. different yeah, yeah. class. So the, the centipedes, the other two are, are insignificant. Are they uh, centipedes because they really do have 100 legs or they just call them that? No, they don't have a hundred. Yeah, legs. Yeah. yeah, I think they have twenty legs per side, something okay. like that. Um, but uh, the, the only one of, of significance is the, is the big one. And so, this is what I would suggest to people: if you see a centipede, um, get it out of the house. Don't, mm, you go, you yeah. do not want to live a centipede. Mm-hmm. Some people are fine with it. Um, some sure. of the cultures here, um, I believe, the Samoans. Um, uh, you know, you see a lot of guys with with. I've seen tattoos the tattoos, on. the centipede tattoos. Sure. So, so yeah. we had a, a Samoan guy who worked with us, and he would walk around with the centipede on him. He he, he didn't mind them. He loved them. And he had centipedes walk. He would have them walk on him, and he had no problem with that. But uh, so some Okay, I'm really not riding them. with him. When he, next time, I'm not riding with <laughs> exactly. him. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so some people really appreciate them. But in my opinion, you should not have them in your house because mm-hmm. they, they can cause significant harm. What is their prey? What do they eat? Are they eating the, ro- but, the, the outside roaches mostly? The most common thing that they eat is the Pacific beetle roach, which gotcha. is outside. Okay. And so. Uh, now, it, it, once again. Um, I, I was mentioning before when we were in the cockroach segment, we were talking about moss rock walls. Many of us have moss rock walls, and, and I think that the only ones that I've seen in my yard have been around the walls. Yep, um, because they're probably chasing the cockroaches. Probably, yeah. Um, so yeah. that's what it is. But here's what I would do. <clears throat> Everyone has the potential to have centipedes who, lives, who, who has a bottom floor um, or single standing structure. Mm-hmm. So if you've got you know, bushes and plants and, and soil around you, you've got the potential for having centipedes. So what do you want to do to keep the centipedes out is that you want to make sure they can't get in, exclude them. Make sure, like we mentioned before, have your screens, have your doors, mm-hmm. and have your thresholds such that they can't get underneath them because centipedes love to go through sliding glass doors. So what they'll do is they'll come in at an angle, they'll slide underneath the door where the wheel is and where pop out on the other side. Oh, boy. So um, always check your glass doors and screen doors. Make sure mm-hmm. that they, they cut, they, they're shut properly. The other thing to think about with centipedes, amazingly, they enter homes through the attic fence. So they'll walk along, find a house, and just go straight just up. Just go straight up the wall. Yeah, yeah. They'll get to an attic vent, 
And they were like, oh, here we are, let's go. So they would go in, mm-hmm. walk along, and then in your cutouts where your lights come down or your fan is, they'll walk in there, drop out, and land on your bed. You've mentioned in previous shows that one of the things that you use uh, when you do a tenting or do a termite you know, in, um, treatment on a home, that you're going to put this, uh, this borate uh, in, the, in the attic. Right. And you're going to dust the attic. <laughs> Does that help in, in, in centipedes, or is that something that is not effective on them? And if, if so, what is? Okay, so in my opinion, one of the single most effective things that we do as a company mm-hmm. is dust addicts. Now, yeah. dusting addicts has been around since probably the 20s, mm, and, it okay. hasn't, and it hasn't changed. All right. Boric acid dust is inexpensive. Most pest control companies don't even consider doing it because it's been around so long, and it, it's obviously an old product. No one thinks it has much yeah. value. But in my opinion, dusting the attic is a single best thing you can do for your home because mm-hmm. what happens is that dust is an inorganic compound. It will never break down, yet it's, it's, it's like a mineral salt. So it's okay. not toxic to humans, mm-hmm. but it is toxic to every single insect. That means that if it's a centipede, termite swarmers that are flying mm-hmm. into your, your attic to, to start a new colony, ants, uh, cockroaches, whatever. If you've treated your, your attic with dust, which is a fairly inexpensive service, um, it'll last forever. You treat it once and it's done. I ran into somebody at the shopping center the other day that's a new listener of our show. And he said, you know, y- you're hearing from Michael Botha about all of these wonderful things. Uh, when you start talking about these things, uh, a lot of people think, well, this is something you can do it yourself. There, there, and I know that you've always encouraged people to do that. And there are plenty of things you can do. But what's the sign that somebody has right now? That it's not working, you know. I mean, I mean, I've just got these things every time I see them. I do what I'm supposed to do, but I, I need somebody to come out and find out where they're coming from because so, I you know, get get at the source. So that's a good point. So we call them RPM thresholds or integrated pest management thresholds, mm-hmm. and and each person has their own threshold for pain. Okay, sure. and and, and so truth, yeah. right. So yeah. some people are quite happy to see two cockroaches, but t- ten cockroaches is too much. Mm-hmm. If you see one centipede, that's too much. If you see any termites eating your house, that's too much. So, but other people have different opinions on that. And so my, opinion, my, my thought is that when you reach a point where you're not comfortable with living with the pest that you've got, that's the point at, at which you should call in a professional to take it to the next level. Because there's a lot you can do on your own. Exclusion mm-hmm. being the most valuable thing you could do is to exclude pests from your house. But when you get to the point that they're infesting you, then it's sometimes better to bring in a professional. And that, uh, by the way, it, when you know it's time to do that, uh, you're you're going to go to sandwichisle.com, sandwichisle.com, or five four five six seven seven one six on the telephone. We're going to turn into that in a minute. But it wouldn't be fair to all of those that are out there sitting on the edge of their seat and listening to us talk about centipedes that we talk about the other uh, insect that we know to be a real concern and a real stinger and hard to differentiate sometimes, and that's a scorpion. That's is, right. that a, is that an issue? And is it is it seasonal? What about scorpions? You know why? Because I know we've got them. Scorpions usually are found in dry areas. Mm-hmm. Um, so... For example, the the, the entire um, windward coast mm-hmm. and the leeward coast. On the windward coast, where it's real wind blown, on the beaches, you often find them in the bark of some of the trees that are, that line the beaches. Yeah, maybe coconut trees too. Um, I haven't seen them on coconut trees, mm-hmm. but a lot of the I think it's called kamali. It's yeah, the beach yeah. kamali. I think it's called. I've often seen and a them lot of nalpaca. I, I understand yep, that it gets nalpaca. into that nalpaca as well. And any yeah. driftwood that has bark kind of peeling away. So any dead wood on the beach where really? the bark yeah. peels away. Very often, if they'll be hiding right underneath it. Um, you know what, Michael? When you take a look at one of these things, you know, they've got these two back things, and then they got this thing up in the air. Right. That thing up in the air is the one that gets you, isn't it? So you got it backwards. So the two things in the front uh-huh. are the pinchers. Oh. It looks like it's backwards. Oh, so and the thing the, in the back is no big deal? That's the stinger. And so at the, at the end of that mm-hmm. is a little bulb filled with poison. Oh, boy. And some very, very sharp hairs, which is like a little needle mm-hmm. that with injection, like a little injection hole. So what, what it does is typically they clasp their prey. So let's say it's going after a cockroach. Mm-hmm. They'll clasp their prey with their pinches, hold it in place, and then they'll whack it multiple times with the stinger. The stinger injects a poison into the prey. The poison rapidly kills the prey. Now, I was going to say, they, it kills the prey, doesn't it? kills the prey. It? But, but it doesn't necessarily kill us. Can it kill us, or is it mostly just <laughs> it's, it's just painful? So we're fortunate that in Hawaii, the, the little brown scorpion that we have mm-hmm. is not highly venomous. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> some are in some places of the world, right? Yeah, so yeah. once again, going back to Africa, mm-hmm. in, in my days in Africa, when I was in the Army, we used to capture them. 
and these are the giant African scorpions. These things are massive. They're yeah. six inches long. I remember seeing and, one on a James Bond movie one time. Oh, they're and incredible. And it was monstrous. No, yeah. they're incredible. We, yeah. we'd, we'd take the innards out of our steel helmet mm. and then put two of them in a steel helmet and uh, let them go <laughs> at each other. And it's unbelievable. Oh, they they, uh, they they'll they'll crack another insect in half with their pinches. Wow! And uh, in fact, we even put one in with a snake the one time, and, and they killed the snake. No. And uh, Gee, so no, they, yeah. they're very and they're deadly poisonous. Um, but these ones over here are not highly poisonous. But the sting also hurts. I've been stung by them before, mm-hmm. and it, it actually hurts a lot too. Not as bad as a, as a centipede, I don't think. I I know that uh, parents particularly, and and here we are on the cusp of summer. Uh, they get all worried because a lot of most of these things you're talking about, the big danger is outside. Uh, when they get inside, you really have a problem. But isn't it pretty easy for a kid rolling around on the beach or, you know, hanging out in the in the in the uh, in the forest near their house to get uh, stung or bitten? Uh, when somebody comes running into the house, it's too late to fumigate that pest. But what do they do with somebody that is bitten? So, in the case of a of a centipede, mm-hmm. you'll or, see or, there's yes. there's two there'll be two bite marks, okay, and it often draws blood, and uh, it'll swell up. So people have various different reactions. Mm-hmm. If someone has a reaction. Then uh, what I've found is works really good is put ice on it straight away. Okay. The oh, ice seems okay. to take the pain away, mm-hmm. and uh, even meat tenderizer mixed with saliva, put that yeah. on it. That seems to work pretty good. If there's if it's really really painful, you might be allergic. Then go and see a doctor mm-hmm. immediately. Um, the same thing with a scorpion. So a scorpion, when it stings you, very often there isn't a very big bump. Um, so it'll hurt like crazy, but it doesn't leave like uh, a raised bump like a centipede does. One thing, you know, we, we've learned a little bit about centipedes. If you got some, if you see them, they are more. I mean, you know, you don't just have one centipede, right? Well, there's, there's like a wives' tale in Hawaii that's, mm-hmm. uh, that they like husband and wife will travel together. Oh, is that right? And if you kill one, it'll, the other one will come and get you. That's, that's, oh, that's, that's probably not true. Okay. <laughs> but not, the truth, thank the, goodness. Yeah. The truth is, when there's a lot of mature centipedes, it's because it's a good food source. Mm-hmm. So the reason there's more than one usually is because the first one was there because of the food source. It wasn't just an occasional invader. It, were, it was there because it was after something. It, you know, it, I would imagine that some people, when they're selecting their home, uh, the, the bigger the lot, the, the bigger the opportunity to have creepy crawlies on it, right? Well, yeah. that's that's yeah. true, but the ones in the away from the house are not a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I wouldn't recommend even treating those. Treat your plants for white fly and mold, sure, sure. You know, sooty mold and aphids and things like that. But in terms of those insects, I wouldn't even worry about those. You know, I'll, on that so I know we got to move along and do some other things. But you said <laughs> plants. Sometimes people will be, you know – not seeing the danger and maybe not understanding what the risks are. You mentioned white fly. Some of the other things can be a problem, not just the way your plants look, but they can actually be a problem to your garden. And I know that sometimes you get called up on stuff that is appropriate to talk about or not. When somebody calls you about white fly, what do you tell them? So we service, we do white fly yeah. services. So typically, <clears throat> white fly, they're a major problem in Hawaii. Oh, yeah. And uh, they, especially for in your gardens, like yellow everywhere. hibiscus, mm-hmm. they'll completely destroy a hibiscus bush. Yeah. <clears throat> and so... The best way to approach something like that is actually to remove as many of the leaves and infested area as possible. Okay. And get that off your property. Don't go and throw it in your mulch pile because it's going to yeah. reinfest the entire yard say. as and a result well, wait of that. that. That's a whole other category. We don't have time to really get into it, this program. <laughs> but we have more and more people, Michael, that are buying these composting things. Yeah. And it's a great thing to do. But with it comes some risks and some problems, right? That's right. You know, because what you're doing is creating a food chain. It depends. Some of them are enclosed, Mm -hmm. and others, like mine, is not enclosed. Mine's a pit, and uh, it's filled with centipedes and and cockroaches, but it has earthworms, too, and other positive things. White flies looks like white powder on the underside of your leaves, to to many, right? But what about about these plants, beautiful plants, that all of a sudden there's holes all over them? Yeah, so... So we're fortunate to have all kinds of plant eating yeah, yeah. insects. Good for your business, not <laughs> yeah. so good for my yard. Yeah. So yeah, the, yeah. the key thing though is identifying them and removing the damaged mm-hmm. uh, the the damaged leaves if it's white fly or mold um, or mealy bugs, and then doing some sort of um, treatment, a systemic treatment whereby mm-hmm. you treat the soil, and the plants take up the active ingredients, and then when yeah. those insects eat them, they actually die. And yeah. So, that's so the, in, in other words, it. if you're expecting an instant gratification knee-jerk reaction, it's probably not going to happen. you got to look at what you're doing, find out what the solution is, and then be patient. It's a long-term yeah, solution, yeah, yeah. and it's something that needs to be repetitive, but it, it, it certainly can control any problem that way. Who hasn't had a picnic ruined by ants? There's all kinds of ants, and we got some specific ants we're going to talk about right now. But one thing I can tell you about Sandwich Isle, uh, I saw one of the TV commercials the other night, 
and it says you you expect more, and guess what? You get more. We'll be right back with more What's Bugging You with Michael Bolfa right after this. At Sandwich Isle, we're committed to great service. Our trained service specialists will protect your home against damage caused by termites and prevent unwanted and unhealthy pests. We believe that if we tell a customer we're going to do something, we ought to do it. And if we don't do it to their complete satisfaction, they deserve their money back. We believe in total customer satisfaction, which is why when you call Sandwich Isle, you can expect more and get it. As the largest fumigation company in Hawaii, we know that sometimes tenting your home just isn't the best solution. We really wanted to avoid the hassle of moving out. Tent fumigation just didn't work for our family. Sandwich Isle offers an eco-friendly alternative to fumigation. They use a special engineered orange oil that provides natural termite control. No tenting, no moving, no hassle, and no risk. Our orange oil service is the most convenient and environmentally responsible treatment available. Call us to learn more about orange oil today. You know, I just had to surprise Michael Botha with this little piece of music. Because ants, you know, you take a look at an ant and you think, no big thing. You take a look at three or four ants, you think, nah, no big thing. You see 10 million ants and you think, oh my goodness, this is a big thing. Every now and again you'll hear from aardvark to anteaters. And I've seen these ant these anteaters. We don't have them here, I, I, I guess. Maybe we should import some. Wait a minute. We're about invasive species. Uh, ants are a nightmare, and particularly some. And the big buzzword lately, Michael Botha, has been these what they call little fire ants. <laughs> Yeah, these these are the little fire ants that were originally found on the Big Island, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of them were in landscape um, ornamentals, and uh, they were spread throughout the island, supposedly by those ornamentals being shipped to different locations. Yeah. And when you say ornamentals, you meaning you know we got flower flower for lay, we got orchids, we got yeah, all these beautiful desirable things. desirable plants, for example, sure. bamboo. A lot of bamboos grown yeah, on the yeah. Big Island, and so um, I know some of the the. Um, and colonies were moved because they were the the root bundle on a bamboo plant is huge, and so it easily um, provides room for them I was to hide say, it inside looks like there. Going to accommodate a lot of ants. Yeah, exactly. And so that, that's that's what's happened. You can't blame anyone for it. No, it's just uh, that's no. how these invasive species get in, and they um, make the most of the environment. Often, and un- un- they outcompete the endemic. Um, insect, and they have no predators, and so that's how they just begin to proliferate. Yeah, now, that, now therein lies my, I, and you know me, I always ask this question. Uh, when I'm looking at ants, I can't recall seeing a whole bunch of things eating them. So do they have any enemies? And if so, who, what are their, what what lives on ants? Roaches? I mean, who, who bites, who eats ants? Yeah, so um, ants are, don't have that many predators, to be honest. Yeah. So ants and termites hate each other. So termites will eat ants. Oh, okay, good. They'll well, let me say that again. Termites will kill ants, but they won't eat them. Ah. Because termites eat wood, but, <laughs> but ants yeah. will eat the termites. In fact, the yeah. ants will eat pretty much anything. And so, you are, Aren't you amazed? I mean, you're, you're in the extermination business. That's why your company is called Sandra Pest Solutions, because that's what you do. But are you amazed at the, the colonies, colonies and, the, and the seeming intelligence of these things? No, it's amazing, and, and it's yeah. uh, it's amazing how resilient they are. So, you know, there's certain species of ants, for example, the ferro ants, which are commonly found indoors. Mm-hmm. So we were talking earlier about what you can do and, and uh, what can a homeowner do. Well, here's what you should not do. If you have ferro ants and you spray it with an aerosol yeah. over the counter, whatever, um, they actually split up into about 10 more satellite colonies. And so the instinctive response to a threat is to actually split Multiply. up. And multiply. Oh my god. And goodness. so now you've got 10 colonies. So <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've ever heard these stories about a pest control service where the guy went out and treated the ants, but mm-hmm. and then the customer calls back and says, Well, now I've got ants everywhere. Yeah. Well, that's something. I only had them in the garage, now they're everywhere. Exactly. So, <laughs> oh, so that was probably ferro ants, right? Yeah, I where get you, it. you go out and you treat them. So you can't treat them with a the chemical. Mm-hmm. What you have to do is you have to bait them, and you have to give them a slow enough acting bait that they can't figure out what's, kill, what's, what's causing them to yeah, die off. Because if it's a fast acting yeah. bait and they die straight away, um, they'll have that same response. There's other things that you do at Sandwich Isle that is designed to the, have the aggressive uh, target take these food source back to the nest and That's feed right. everybody. That's actually 
awesome way to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a more scientific way. Yeah, <clears throat> and it takes time though, doesn't it? And typically, yeah. it involves things that are not conventional pesticides. For mm-hmm. example, um, the Centricon termite baiting system, which is a fantastic solution to subterranean termites, um, uses um, a hormone that is fed to the termites through this bait. Right. They take. I that, love this. Act. I got this at my house, guys. Yeah. So yeah. they they take mm-hmm. the bait back to the colony, mm-hmm. regurgitate it, and feed all the other members of the colony because they're social insects. They all need each yeah. other to feed each other. Mm-hmm. They'll feed it to the entire colony, and then as they go through their very abrasive environment, and they literally get sanded down every day as they're walking through their little mud tunnels, mm-hmm. they have to replace their exoskeleton because it wears out. So what happens is, they go through a molting cycle. And when they go through the molting cycle, the exoskeleton initially is very soft, but then it hardens. Mm-hmm. Well, this hormone causes them so that they don't harden. So they All go right. through their molt, and they just basically come apart as jelly and fall apart. And mm-hmm. it, it impacts the entire colony. Isn't it true, though, that you must be – you know, you can sort of explain the typical customer. When the customer finally gets to a point where they call you and you send one of your, one of your estimators or one of your experts out there to sort of triage what this, what this customer needs – they want now fixed. You know, how hard is it sometimes to explain, look, here's the battle that we got to do, and here's how, here's, here's how we're going to do this. You know, um, that whole RPM threshold thing yeah. uh, where people have different limits of pain. <laughs> um, so some people will say, I don't care what the cost. Yeah, I want, I want you here I today. Want this, uh, yeah. For example, drywood termites. Mm. You have that option. You can tent fumigate, and you can kill it one shot, done. Mm. Um, if you have more time or you don't want to do it, there's other options, orange oil, or using um, the boric acid type services mm-hmm. I was telling you about, they take a little bit longer, but um, in, in some cases they, they're yeah. more effective. In, in the final analysis, I guess that's why. Okay, I, I, I know that we, we really need to do some things to make sure that people understand at what point in time, what is your breaking point? What's the straw that breaks the camel's back? Uh, we we want to finish up on this ants. Uh, that We've learned already, all right, they don't really have any predators. Nobody's eating them. That means that if we provide food for them, we're going to get. We're, they're going to keep them. You, when you see these things going up the wall and looking like going into your ceiling, where is it? Where, where do you treat? Where, where do you? What do you do to get to find so, out where these guys are coming from? How to get rid of them? So the key thing is to exclude all insects from your structure. Mm-hmm. So what you want to do is anything that's inside, you need to kill them, and then put a barrier around the perimeter of your structure. Mm-hmm. So a, a, a pesticide barrier is the most effective. And that will keep them out as they find their way towards your structure and go over that, that treated barrier. They'll die off or be repelled by it. Mm-hmm. That's the most effective way. But there's other things that you can do. For example, um, plants. Like right outside your window over here, we're looking at this palm tree touching your window. Yeah, by the way, that's, that's here in our building. At my house, I learned from Michael a long time ago. Matter of fact, i got to tell you, one of your guys that's been in my house for years and years who's – he's been promoted upwards in the company, so I don't have him anymore. It's Herman. killing me. Herman. Yeah. Great guy. Uh, he's, he was often telling me, hey, next time, you know, you're the yard guy. you got to cut that because that's like a bridge. That, that's yeah. right. And, yeah. and, and and he's been promoted. He actually services my house. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he handles, uh, you get all the good guys. He, yeah. he handles the North Shore route. Yeah. Um, but um, basically, like this palm tree touching us right now, ants will actually travel. Let's say you have a perfect pesticide right. barrier around the base of your structure. They'll travel up the tree climb down that branch, and then climb into your roof from the hey, Let, from let here. me tell you, what we got here is the perfect storm. Because right down where you park, there's hibiscus. Yes. And there's ants in the hibiscus. And there's tr- this tree is in the hibiscus plant. So there's hibiscus in our ceiling. That, that, I mean, uh, ants in our ceiling. That, that's right. And yeah. you, have, you, you have your own... Uh, and we know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. You have the perfect little environment. So I looked yeah. at those hibiscus down there. Mm-hmm. So you have white fly. Yep. <laughs> you, you have ants, yep. which are farming the aphids. That's why the ants are there. Okay. Because the ants are shifting the aphids around. The aphids stick their little mouth parts into the underside of the leaves. Mm-hmm. And as the, the liquids and, and nutrients pass through the plant, they go through those mouth parts and the aphids get their yeah. sustenance. But what happens is they don't disconnect their mouth parts when they're full. They just start pooping the stuff out. Yeah. Well, that stuff that falls out is uh, a sweet nectar. And the ants like to eat that. And so what they do is they shift those aphids around to where it's convenient for them. And that's how they get that nectar. So they're actually farming those Killing things. Me. You're killing me here. Well, listen, my friends, uh, we, we really hope that you've learned a little something today. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we hit all the points on what you want. So we always open the programs we did earlier with what's in the news today. We learned a, a little about these these Brazilian uh, wandering spiders and then went through, uh, you know, cockroaches and ants and, and stuff. But we got plenty more to come. And we want, we want to invite you uh, to please go to the website 
and let us know number one what you think of the show, and and number two, uh, Michael, if you the, 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 real quickly you can give them the points, what to do to to stay on top of your problem. That you never have to live with pests. There's not a pest problem that can't be solved. Exclude them from your home, and when you do get them, and that threshold where it's causing pain for you, take action immediately, and you can get the problem solved. There you go. And in the meantime. I want you to go to SamWithChildPestSolutions.com. Thanks for listening. Tell everybody, and we'll see you again next week for another episode of What is Bugging You? Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. And in the meantime, jump online and find more at sandwichisle.com. That's sandwichisle.com. 